this is the last time you're going to have to listen to me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you, Ray. <laughs> so, so let me take a moment to editorialize, right? You may notice we are, not all the speakers have been agreeing all of the time. Honestly, sincerely, that's a wonderful thing. That's how we make progress in science. One of the things I can't stand about TV science shows, even the good ones, is that the directors of those shows have a horror of controversy. They cannot stand to allow two different voices to say different things. So what they do is they make an editorial decision as to which voice they're going to go with. And they could do that on all sorts of grounds, often completely cosmetic grounds. Who has the better head of hair seems to often be an important consideration for TV producers. And they make that decision, and then they show you a program, and my god, don't they make science seem boring? Isn't it so boring when there's just this one narrative, and the voiceover says, and the scientists discovered, and the scientists believe, like all scientists are always agreeing about everything all of the time? I'm so thrilled that Prescott set this up so that we're having real discussions and real arguments, because it's out of those discussions and arguments that progress will be made. And the progress will come from people collecting data that will tell us which way nature really is. In the present discussions, what dogs really are. Those of us that are in the game of doing science, we believe our own theories, but we have been so often beaten by nature that we know that we have to be willing to let these children die, these theories die. Nature beats them out of us. And so I don't want to sound like Basil Fawlty. I don't know whether Fawlty Towers means as much to you as it does to me. And perhaps my all-time favorite episode is the hotel inspectors. And uh, Basil knows that there are hotel inspectors in town, but he's hopelessly confused about which of his guests might be the hotel inspector. And so there's one guest that through most of the episode he kisses butt to, believing this to be the hotel inspector, who then turns out quite near the end of the episode not to be the hotel inspector. And so Basil beats him up. He literally <laughs> beats the shit out of this guy, only to realize at the very last moment that the man standing quietly next to him as he ki literally kicks this guest is in fact the hotel inspector. And so Basil turns to the man who he now realizes truly is the hotel inspector. He says, incidentally, I don't know if you realize, he's, he's a regular customer of ours. He loves it here. It's his second home. The only danger is that somebody is going to think that he isn't satisfied about something, or the fighting is real, and tell somebody. So I don't want to sound like Basil Fawlty. The fighting is real. The fighting is real. We do have intellectual disagreements, and I hope that in this forum and in other forums, you will see our understanding of dogs move forward. Most likely, it won't be that I'm right and Adam's wrong, or that Adam's right and I'm wrong, or Ray, or, or Michael, or whatever. Most likely, we are all simply wrong, and nature will pull some surprises on us, and that's how we will move forward. But I wanted to have it on record that I'm a tremendous fan. Michael Fox, his work is a complete inspira inspiration to me, and Adam, was sort of somebody, when I first started reading into this field, I thought, this is just amazing that there's this guy. Where is Budapest? How could they be doing this? It's been fantastic. Ray has been a real mentor to me, uh, uh, be beating me with sticks a lot of the time. It's true, but um, a real mentor to me. And when you look at the, the younger generation of people that we have with, with us, Alexandra and Monique, and Catherine, I think we have tremendous grounds for optimism that we are entering into a new epoch in the scientific study of dogs. So I wanted to uh, put that out there. One of the things Adam said uh, when he was talking about, he put it, um, what did he put it? He talked about sports teams and supporting different sports teams. And I actually feel exactly the same, and I expressed it in, in my book, Animal Cognition, which, uh, with Monique's help, we now have a new edition of Animal Cognition coming out this fall. And the fields that we talk about, ethology, behaviorism, uh, these are actually very old fields in science. You know, I mean, it's time that we move forward, and maybe we should come up with some new ology to uh, help us with that. Okay. So let's get on with uh, 
with the, with, the, with the little talk that I prepared for you. So dog smarts, what is the nature of dog smarts? What are dogs actually good for? Well, Brian Hare, who was here at least in, in uh, Skype spirit uh, a couple of hours ago, recently published this very interesting book, The Genius of Dogs, How Dogs Are Smarter Than You Think. Um, actually, I disagree with Brian about an enormous number of things. But I thought that there was uh, an aspect in the introduction to this book where he talks very interestingly about, well, what does he mean by the genius of dogs? What's the genius of dogs? Well, he says the genius of dogs is their adaptation to their niche. That's the, a good biological. If we're going to take a, an everyday word, genius, and bring it into a scientific language, then I, I would say that the behavioral adaptation of dogs to their niche is indeed a good uh, definition of genius. This is, this is me and my dog, who unlike all the dogs that we ever talk about in experiments, she, she really does love me. She really does understand everything I say. <laughs> she is a quite exceptional beast, and I'm really looking forward to seeing her again on Wednesday, uh, where she will greet me with great enthusiasm. It has to be said that she greets me with great enthusiasm if I've been away for anything over 10 minutes. Uh, her sense of time seems to be now, which lasts for 10 minutes, and then forever, which is anything over 10 minutes. <laughs> anyway, this is Zephos in her, in her niche my home, that's her niche. Uh, and I fear that Brian, in a lot of his book, talks as if this kind of a niche is the only niche for a dog, where actually, and this has already come up a little bit, dogs can have very diverse niches, and uh, a little bit of, did I show you this picture before? I showed you some pictures of dogs in the Bahamas. Here's a, a village dog, a street dog, that's a niche that we've, that we've talked about. Here's a picture I know I showed you before. This is, um, uh, Odysseus and his, his dog Argus, and I talked about how that was the, uh, some of the earliest evidence that people could have uh, strong emotional connections to dogs. But the author that we call Homer also has another work ascribed to him. The other work is the Iliad, which is a story of battles and fighting, and in the Iliad, there's mention of another niche for dogs, dogs as weapons of war. So in this illustration, you can see that this dog is attacking somebody. And in book 22 of the Iliad, which is believed to be about 3,000 years ago that this was written, Hector and Achilles are going to fight. Uh, but before they fight, they slag each other off. That's obviously an ancient human tradition. And Hector is very worried that, well, he's not worried that he's going to be killed. He's expecting to be killed, and that's a perfectly honorable thing to have happen to you, to be killed in battle. What he's worried about is that his corpse will be dishonored by Achilles' dogs. And he says, uh, well, but when the dogs disfigure shamefully an old man, chewing his gray beard, his gray head, his beard, his sexual organs, that's the saddest thing we wretched mortals see. And Hector says, by your life, I beg you, by your knees, your parents, don't let the dogs eat me. And Achilles fires back, no one who will, keep, will keep the dogs from going at your head, and they'll just be, all that will be left of you, wriggling worms will eat you once dogs have had their fill of your bare corpse. Well, it sounds archaic, right? I mean, the language is obviously archaic. It sounds, on the face of it, like a very archaic idea. But actually, the United States Army still uses war dogs. This wasn't exactly a secret. It had been mentioned uh, in a few places, but it became most apparent in the press when Osama bin Laden was killed and there was uh, quite public mention of the use of a dog in that attack. Dogs have a long history in uh, the Americas. Columbus brought no dogs with him in 1492, but he immediately recognized that since the natives were naked, that dogs would be a really excellent weapon. So when he came back the second time, which I think was 1494, something that someone you would know. Um, he brought dogs with him, and he used the dogs on the natives, and he said that the dogs were, uh, one dog was as valuable as seven men in putting the natives to flight. And uh, that continued uh, throughout the history of the colonization of the Americas, that war dogs were a very important weapon. Uh, this is a representation of Spanish generals watching how their dogs destroy the natives. Dogs continued to be used in the First World War. Here's a dog in Belgium pulling a machine gun cart. So that's one niche for dogs that's easily overlooked. The Native Americans themselves had dogs. 
Did you know not a single bark was heard in the Americas before Columbus came here? The Native Americans from the far north to the south of uh, Argentina had dogs. Those dogs did not bark. And they were relatively small or very gentle dogs. They were not used as war dogs, but they were used as beasts of burden. And archaeologists can tell us from the wear patterns on the bones of dogs that are found that belonged to Native Americans before Europeans came here, they can tell from the wear pattern on the joints and the bones whether the dog was used to pull a sled or whether the dog had pannier bags strapped onto its back and carried burdens in that way. And here in Washington State, around Seattle, there was a unique niche for dogs. Dogs around here were reared for wool. This is the, uh, the wool dogs of the Salish people, who are the Native Americans around uh, the vicinity where we are right now. And I was actually rather hoping that I might be able to see some wool blankets, and I contacted an, a, uh, an author who published a paper on them, and he told me that unfortunately, no wool blankets are available for public view in uh, Washington State whatsoever. The only public locations where you can see these wool, dog wool blankets are the Smithsonian Institution in DC and the British Museum in London. So I'm gonna try and see them when I go to London. There's also been talk, and I'm gonna get into trouble again in the discussion section, that I've stolen a few more of Ray Coppinger's photographs here. Let's talk about livestock guarding dogs, and uh, it's been talked about quite a bit already, so I don't need to to uh, rub that in for you. I think, Ray, you told us yesterday that this is the most common niche for a dog worldwide. It's the most popular working dog. Most popular working dog, thank you. Populous. Populous, right. So the most popular working dog. These are, these, this is a Maremma watching a lamb. Um, what have I got, what have I got? This is goat guarding in South Africa, and this is, again, a Maremma guarding sheep, this time in Argentina. All photos courtesy of Ray Coppinger, hope you don't mind. <laughs> Another niche which strikes us as, as quite nauseating is the dog as food. Now, I'm not going to show you any of those truly nauseating pictures of dog, dogs being prepared for slaughter or after they've been slaughtered. Uh, this is a, a graph of the number of registered dog butchers in Germany from 1905 to 1924. And you can see that there's a background level of around 6,000 butchers in Germany registered to slaughter dogs through the early 20th century, with peaks where the number of registered dog butchers doubles uh, during periods of hunger emergency as at the end of the First World War and again during the, uh, the crash of their currency and so on in 1924. These data end in 1924. The author of the paper that I got this from told me that somewhere, but he hasn't been able to find it for me, he has data going up to 1934, but that the number of registered dog butchers in Germany tails off at that point, and that I'm pretty convinced would be because, ironically enough, the Nazis were great animal lovers and banned the butchery of dogs and introduced a whole number of reforms in the care of animals as they took power in the early 1930s. Um, but interestingly, the eating of dogs remains, I mean, obviously, throughout China and Korea, eating dogs remains a, a staple in their diets. Not in Japan, interestingly. They share our abhorrence at the idea. But uh, even in Europe, dogs are still eaten. In Switzerland, it is still legal to eat dogs. And an initiative just last December to pass a law to ban the eating of dogs failed. So it is still legal to slaughter and eat dogs in Switzerland. And around the time of this initiative to pass a new law, uh, a, a, a newspaper ran a survey to find out how many Swiss people ate dog. And these are the results of this survey. Question, have you ever eaten dog or cat? I don't think many people are actually eating cat. Have you ever eaten dog or cat? Yes, once, 7% of respondents. Yes, several times, 9% of respondents. No, are people really still doing that, 84%. So 84% of Swiss are with, I'm, I hope I speak for us all, um, on the side of not eating dogs, but add them up, nine plus seven, 16% of Swiss have eaten dog at least once. This is also a niche for an animal. It's an odd way of looking at things, that an animal could have an adaptive advantage to being eaten, but the animals we eat 
exist in far greater numbers on the planet than related animals that we do not eat. And in very many cases, the animals we eat, their wild uh, relatives are completely extinct. So yes, being somebody else's dinner can be uh, a niche. Okay, not that I'm advocating it in this particular case. I did, uh, when I was in Korea, I did go to the dog meat market, and I'm not a vegetarian, so I felt that I, I would try it. And I had committed to memory the name of the dish. Boysen tang is the name for dog stew. But I just, I just, in the end, I couldn't do it. In the end, I chickened out. I, I, I really was, it really is a, a shocking, upsetting thing. All right, okay. So, if we're going to understand the intelligence and cognition of dogs, I'm, I'm entirely in agreement with Brian Hare that we need to understand what dogs do in their niche, and so it's valuable to explore every aspect of that niche. Okay, but let's move forward, and let's explore some more concrete ideas about what dog intelligence might be like. Some years ago now, Brian Hare and uh, Michael Tomasello published this graph where they put forward the hypothesis that dogs have evolved special cognitive skills in understanding what people are up to. And so what's shown here is evolution running up the page, and over here we human beings have certain remarkable abilities to understand what each other are up to, and meanwhile Brian and others have tested bonobos and chimpanzees, human beings' closest relatives, on a number of tests of these kinds of social cognition, and they report that our closest relatives fail on those tests. Meanwhile, Brian gave some somewhat similar tests uh, originally to his own pet dog. Um, Adam McClosey was doing the same thing at around the same time on the other side of the world, and they both found that the dogs were strikingly successful on these kinds of tests whereas they both reported that wolves were unsuccessful. And so Brian proposed that dogs, by virtue of living alongside humans, had evolved certain special abilities that are unique among non-human animals in understanding what people are up to. Now the actual uh, archetypal test of this skill is very, very straightforward. It's simply the question, does the animal go where you point? So you hold the animal back a couple of meters from you, you stand between two containers, and you make some kind of a pointing gesture at one of those containers, and given that you're interested solely in whether the animal can follow your hand movement or perhaps your foot movement, it can be done different ways, you would stare straight ahead and avoid making eye contact with the animal. You could, of course, test whether the animal will follow your gaze. That would be a different condition. So that's the basic test. And um, it's always good when you're getting into a new realm of science to try out for yourself the experiments that others before you have done. That's part of what makes science a different way of understanding the world, that it's public knowledge. And at least in principle, everybody should be able to repeat an experiment and see if they get the same result. So uh, Monique Udell and I got an invitation to go out to Wolf Park, where they've been hand-rearing wolves now for over 40 years, and were invited to try and uh, try this test on their animals. Now, unfortunately, we didn't take video of that very first visit. So the video I have to show you is of a subsequent visit. In the very first visit, we had the wolves tested by the caretakers at Wolf Park, in particular, Pat Goodman, who's with us here this afternoon, was one of our key experimenters. And Monique and I stood outside the enclosure and shouted instructions through the fence at Pat and the others who were doing it. But as I say, I don't have video of that. I actually have video from a later replication where we wanted to see if it actually made any difference if you put a stranger into the enclosure and had a stranger make the pointing gestures. So the video you're going to see, you're going to see my student Lindsay Mayercom, who had never been to Wolf Park before on the date that this was done, and she is going to make some pointing gestures at one of two paint cans on the ground in front of her. And if it looks a little bit odd that there's somebody standing right behind her, that's because these really are wolves. And Wolf Park have a policy, an eminently reasonable policy, that no lay person is allowed in the enclosure without an experienced staff member from the park standing as close to them as possible in case anything happens. It looks a little bit odd, but, but 
it has a purpose. So that's Lindsay freezing her butt off out there and Amanda Shad standing right behind her to make sure she doesn't become dog's uh, wolf's breakfast. And you see the two cans on the ground, one there, one there. Okay, let's let it roll. And she's gonna point at one of them. Calls the animal, points. People wanna do PhDs with me because they think it's gonna be warm in Florida. I make them go up to Indiana in March and freeze to death. Just gonna do three trials edited out of a sequence of 10. That was incorrect. The first one was correct. This one's incorrect. She's chosen the wrong one. Nine is B. Okay, and then a last third. Third one. Okay. Uh, it's a little break, but it's interesting. She'll, she's, he's interrupted by something we can't hear or see, but he continues on. He makes the correct choice. Okay, very good, so that's a wolf, and we test it. Doesn't matter where the wolf goes after it's made, it's only the initial choice that counts. Okay, all right, thank you very much, well done. We did the same thing on dogs. I'm gonna show you this video, which is dogs in our lo local county animal shelter. We're using their garage space, and this is James, an undergraduate who worked with Monique and I a few years back, and he's going to Okay, same idea here, except he doesn't need a safety person. We don't seem to need to be worried about the shelter dogs. He's pointed to his left. Here comes the puppy, stares at him a bit. There we go, correct choice. Bubby, 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 bubby. That's bubby. Nathan Hall in the background, hey. another of my students. Hey, bubby. Hey. Just three trials. We also did this on people's pet dogs. I'm not going to show you a video of that. It looks exactly the same. Bubby, bubby. Bubby. The next one is B. Oh, that's Monique's voice, isn't it? She's there as well. Hey, bubby. Bubby. Let me make a few comments about the procedure because since we published our results, I've noticed that people have started um, uh, <laughs> saying things about how the experiments were carried out and how we analyze the data, which are not entirely accurate. So this is not exactly how the experiment was done by Brian and Adam. When Brian and Adam, uh, Adam, please contradict me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is, certainly I believe this is true in Brian's experiments, that they always baited one of the containers before they made the point. So that the container that the experimenter is pointing at actually contains food bait. We did that initially, and it didn't seem to matter, but when we got to Wolf Park and we started working like that, we actually had smeared the summer sausage around one of the cans and put a small piece of summer sausage in the other can because judging by what we'd read of other people's work, this was supposed to be an adequate control to ensure that the animals couldn't smell where the meat was located. But with the wolves, unlike the dogs, we found the wolves could sniff out which container had a free piece of food in it. And so we stopped doing that. It's something I would be fascinated to follow up on when I was in Moscow at Sheremetyevo Airport. I saw the dog-jackal hybrids that were bred by a man called Klim Salamov who believes that wild canids have more sensitive noses than dogs do. And so he bred these hybrids to be superior sniffer dogs. I don't think anybody would ever use wolves as sniffer dogs, even if we could prove that their noses were more effective, but it would be rather interesting to know for sure. So anyway, so one small change that I can't see why it should make any difference is that until the dog makes its choice, there is no food in or on either of these containers. But if the animal is supposed to be choosing on the basis of the pointing gesture, and it's understanding that the pointing gesture will bring it food, then that still holds true. It's just as you saw in the video that the food is dropped onto the can the moment the animal makes its choice. The other thing we did was that the very first time we tested wolves, we used a clicker, a standard behavioral training clicker, to mark for the animal that it had made a correct choice. We did that because we were slightly anxious that by modifying the procedure so that there was no longer food in the can, it was just being dropped on the can immediately after the animal made its choice, we were slightly anxious that we were introducing a delay, and since the wolves had been clicker trained, we thought that using a click might help bridge that delay. 
Subsequently, it really seemed unnecessary, so we've never bothered any of the subsequent experiments we've done. We've never used a clicker. But in any case, there's nothing about using a clicker that could tell the animal which choice to make because it doesn't hear the clicker until after it has made a correct choice. And there is nothing about priming a clicker for an animal that, would be, that could be construed as training the animal to go where you point, right? The clicker in itself has nothing to do with following people's points. Anyway, before I get too much further, I better show you the results. Here are the results. It's a 50-50 choice situation. They get 10 goes each, so chance would be 5 out of 10 correct. But as you can see, the wolves at Wolf Park perform well above chance, as do pet dogs. They also perform above chance, as others have found. But to our surprise, dogs tested at the local county animal shelter performed very poorly, performed very poorly. In fact, the way I've presented the data here, it may look as though the shelter dogs are actually performing below chance, as if they are going away from the can that the person is pointing to. Now, that would be a misinterpretation of these results. What the shelter dogs usually do is they don't know where to go, and so they typically stay where they are when they're told to come and make a choice, or they simply run up to the person who has just pointed and often sit cutely in front of that person because they're not idiots. They know that that person has some food, but they do not understand what the pointing gesture means. And so because we only counted correct choices as correct and anything else is a mistake, that leads to the shelter dogs actually having a performance level that is even worse than chance. So, I'm going to come back to these data and to what we think they mean. But first, I'm going to make a very small historical detour because I find that although the modern study of dog intelligence is very, very new, it's a mistake to imagine that we do not have forebears in this endeavor. People have been interested in the science of dog behavior at least since Charles Darwin, who himself actually had a particularly rich relationship with dogs. And you may feel that you've read enough books about dogs, and you may feel that you've read enough books about Darwin, but I heartily recommend a very short book by Emma Townsend called simply Darwin's Dogs. It's a beautiful little book, and it tells you things you didn't know about dogs and things you didn't know about Darwin. And it's from that book that I get this, these, these few uh, points. Darwin's opinions on dogs. One really cute thing is that when Darwin was contemplating getting married, he was always a scientist. He drew up a table, pro and contra. Marry, don't marry. In the marry column, he made a number of scribbled notes that you almost certainly can't read. What it says there is, children, if it please God, it's one of the advantages of marrying, constant companion and friend in old age, who will feel interested in one, object to be beloved and played with, and then he scribbled over the top of that particular passage, ob object to be beloved and played with, better than a dog anyhow. So even contemplating one of life's central decision points, he's thinking about dogs as a comparison group. And then in his published works, he says a number of interesting things about dogs. In The Origin of Species, in 1859, he talks about the natives of the barbarians of Terra del Fuego, the value set on animals even by the barbarians of Terra del Fuego by their killing and devouring their old women in times of dearth as of less value than their dogs. You know, it's only as I was rereading these notes that I thought, I wonder if he was right. Because it seems to me vanishingly unlikely he actually saw somebody eating their old grandmother. He would have heard that second hand. I wonder if it was actually true, because I don't imagine there's all that much meat on a grandmother. <laughs> anyway, um, in the descent of man, you know, I mean, I find it upsetting that a lot of people of, of religious belief resist Darwin's theory of evolution. It seems quite unnecessary to me. I don't see any intrinsic contradiction between religious belief and a belief in evolution. But on the other hand, if you read Darwin, you can see why people of, of strong religious belief could be offended by him. This is a passage from The Descent of Man, 
where he talks about the feeling of religious devotion. It's a, it's a complex one. No being could experience so complex an emotion until advanced in his intellectual and moral faculties to at least a moderately high level. Nevertheless, we see some distant approach to this state of mind in the deep love of a dog for his master associated with complete submission, some fear, and perhaps other feelings. So Darwin is saying that the way your dog loves you is a good way of understanding the way you feel about God. And I can see why people of religious belief could be offended by that. One of Darwin's last books that I think Alexander already mentioned is a, a particularly beautiful book, one I recommend to people who are willing to at least try one of Darwin's books, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals, which is full of illustrations of the emotional expressions of one particular dog. And this was actually Darwin's own dog, Polly, uh, Collie. You know how it is when people have been married for a long time? It often comes to pass that when one partner dies, the other dies soon thereafter. Darwin died on the 18th of April, 1882, and this is Emma Darwin, his wife's journal for that week. Here's the 18th of April, 1882, fatal heart attack at 12. That's Darwin's death. Two days later, Polly died. Polly, Darwin's dog, outlived her master only by two days. Meanwhile, Emma, his wife, lived on for another 14 years. Um, <laughs> she didn't die until 1896. Polly was died under the oak tree in Darwin's garden where many people suspect Darwin himself would have liked to have been buried. He's actually buried in Westminster Abbey next to Newton. Darwin himself, he sparked the ideas that we all use to try and understand dogs and other animals, but he was not a professor. He was not even a particularly gregarious kind of a man. He didn't have any students. There were a couple of camp followers. I won't go into them. The actual scientific study of dogs starts with this man, who is wildly misunderstood. He is often referred to as if he was a behaviorist when he actually despised all psychologists, including behaviorists. He always insisted that his was a physiological approach. This is one of two, one of, two of, of Pavlov's dogs that have survived to the present day, stuffed in museums in Russia. Um, I could go on and on about Pavlov. I have to be careful. It's probably not so interesting for you all. But here's, here's a wonderful group photo, obviously fairly late in Pavlov's life. When I teach this kind of thing, I ask the students to tell me what they notice about this picture. One of the things, I'm not going to ask you, one of the things you notice is there's a dog in the picture. All of the photographs of Pavlov and his lab always have a dog in the picture, even though this is obviously not a laboratory room. They would wheel in a dog. He, there are a number of signs that Pavlov, notwithstanding the kind of research he did, had a great affection for the dog. The other really interesting thing about this picture is it's full of women. There are many, many women in this picture. Pavlov was training women in his laboratory before the communist revolution. He was training women under the czars. He worked at the St. Petersburg Military Medical Academy. Now, by definition, women were not eligible to be students at the St. Petersburg Military Medical Academy. And yet, and yet, well before the Communist Revolution, he had women as his students, and uh, they became an integral part of his lab. I think in this photograph, about one-third of the people in the photo are female, and by the end of Pavlov's life, one-third of all the people he had trained were women, and one of his most important followers was a Jewish woman called Stern, who became the first female member of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end happily. Uh, you wouldn't particularly want to be a, a prominent figure in mid-20th century Russian science. She ended up purged in 1948 in one of Stalin's periodic rages against scientists, and she uh, lived many years in the Gulag. She did survive. She didn't die. Okay. So, what do you know about Pavlov? Well, you know, you've all, you all know this. You've all seen this, right? This cartoon version of Pavlov, ring a bell, the dog salivates. Uh, that's not really terribly interesting. It's not even true. He never used a bell. Um, but the general principle is, 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 is one that he found, that 
a stimulus that is initially neutral, if it's paired with something that has some significance for the animal, then the animal will tend to produce a response to that initially neutral stimulus if the pairing is repeated. I'm sure you all know that, that's all thoroughly boring. The part that's a little bit interesting that I think is worth spending some time talking about that we get from Pavlov's diaries, and we can emphasize here, is that Pavlov was not looking for this. He had no hunch of this. He was not, he was never a psychologist, not even a behaviorist. He was always a physiologist. He was carrying out experiments in physiology. He was obsessed with experimental control. He knew that was crucial to getting good results. Here's a quote from Pavlov. It was thought at the beginning of our research that it would be sufficient simply to isolate the experimenter in the, in the research chamber with the dog on its stand and to refuse admission to anyone else during the course of an experiment. But this precaution was found to be wholly inadequate since the experimenter, however still he might try to be, was himself a constant source of a large number of stimuli. His slightest movements, blinking of the eyelids or movement of the eyes, posture, respiration and so on, all acted as stimuli which when falling upon the dog was sufficient to vitiate the experiments by making the exact interpretation of the results extremely difficult. So, although I have heard many people say that the study of the relationship between people and dogs only, only came about in the last 15 years, in fact, Pavlov in his laboratory carried out experiments on what he called the effect of person, meaning how a human being could be a particular kind of stimulus for the dogs in the experiments. The other thing that comes from paying attention to Pavlov, Pavlov never meant to be doing these experiments on conditioning. He meant to be doing experiments on digestion. And it just so happened that he noticed that any stimulus that predicted that food was going to be put into the dog's mouth would cause the dog to salivate. So it was a completely accidental discovery. I've read people say, I didn't set up any conditioning trials, therefore no conditioning took place. But I'm sorry, conditioning isn't that kind of a thing. You cannot prevent it happening just by not meaning to do it. Any time that this is followed by that, and this is followed by that, then if the second thing is of some significance to the animal, the first thing will come to control the animal's behavior as well. That's all Pavlovian conditioning is. It's just the learning of signals. And so many species have been studied over the years since Pavlov started with dogs. It's a thoroughly widespread phenomenon. All the animals that have ever been tested show the ability to learn of signals. They learn of signals that predict consequences. So when we look at results like this, okay, we only gave the wolves and the dogs 10 goes each, and we certainly, absolutely, categorically did not train any of the animals to go where we point. Nonetheless, their experiences in life are such that they could have had an opportunity to detect that a movement might, like this can lead to a consequence in a location beyond the reach of my hand. That is a perfectly natural part of a pet dog's life. If you feed the dog using your hands, or implements in your hands, as you surely do, then the movements of your hands become important to your animal. If you throw a ball, then the movement of your hand predicts where this desired object is going to end up. So whereas Hare argued that this behavior is innate in pet dogs and impossible in wolves, we suggest that this kind of behavior is learned by animals in their own lifetimes and if the animals have the right kind of experiences, not actual experimental experiences, just everyday experiences, if people throw them balls or feed them with their hands, then they will show a tendency to go where the person points. So why do the shelter dogs on this model do so badly? It seems to me the poor performance of the shelter dogs already refutes Hare's hypothesis, because the shelter dogs are still dogs. They're just living in a different place. They've probably had different early life experiences, and they're now living in a different place. So we were interested, can we get an understanding of what it is about these shelter dog experiences that cause them to do so poorly, and can we remediate their behavior? 
And remediation also has implications for getting these animals adopted. If it turns out to be the case that there's something wrong with shelter dogs, that they never learn the significance of human actions, then maybe that's why they're in the shelter. Maybe they're not well suited to ever be anybody's pet. But on the other hand, if we can help them, that would also have applied consequences. So is it the case that shelter dogs are scared of us? It really doesn't look like it. That's Nicole Dory. We did, before testing them, always have a 10-minute play session a play session in which we were careful not to do anything that could be construed as pointing training, such as throwing a ball. So we were pretty confident they weren't scared of us, they didn't look like it, but they may be not motivated by the treats that we bring. There's Monique. Actually, the shelter dogs absolutely love the, tre the treats that we bring. They don't get treats in the shelter. All right, then. Is there an experiment we could do that could show us whether the shelter dogs can learn to go where you point and whether what they're doing is really learning or just becoming friends with us. Here's the experiment. Take, uh, is that seven dogs? I think it's seven dogs. Take a certain number of dogs and just keep doing this. Just keep pointing, and if they get it right, give them a treat. Pointing, if they get it right, give them a treat. And keep doing this for as long as you're willing to do it, which in this case was 40 attempts. And so here's a dog, dog A, that in fact could learn to go where you point in just seven trials, which took eight minutes. Here's dog B, also learned to go where we pointed in seven trials, which in his case only took six minutes. Here's dog C, the only dog who did not learn to go where we pointed. We gave him the full 40 trials. It took 29 minutes. He never got it. Dog D took 25 trials, took 18 minutes, dog E, dog F, dog G. On average, the dogs needed 20 trials to learn to go where we pointed. I'm sorry, 17 and a half trials to learn to go where we pointed, and that took, on average, 10 minutes. So the question is, the first thing is, yes, we can train shelter dogs to go where people point. They can be redeemed, and indeed, redeeming them takes, on average, just 10 minutes. But the second question is, are we actually training them to go where we point, or are we just giving them an extra 10 minutes to make friends with us? Remember, we'd already given them 10 minutes to make friends with us, but maybe that 10 minutes wasn't enough. Maybe what's actually going on here is that the extra 10 minutes playtime reduced their inhibitions in dealing with us to the point that they would then go where we point. How can we test whether that's the case? Here's what we did. We take another dog, a new dog. There's always, unfortunately, new dogs at the shelter. And we play with that dog for eight minutes before we start the training. So new dog A was played with for an extra eight minutes, but actually took a little bit more training than the original dog A that had not been played with for this extra eight minutes. Eight minutes was that dog's training time. We take a new dog B. We play with new dog B for six minutes before we start training, and you get this. Dog C, played with for 29 minutes, you get that. You get that, you get that, you get that, you get that. On average, the dogs that are given some extra play time learn in exactly the same number of training trials as the blue column dogs that were never given any extra play time. So what this shows us is that we really are training the dogs at the shelter to go where we point, they are not simply becoming relaxed around us by virtue of having some extra experience with us. So it's, I think, an important result. If you care about dogs in the shelter, you can redeem them. There are only two dogs in this whole set of 14 that could not be redeemed in 40 trials, one from the first group, this blue column, one from the second group, that orange column. And who's to say that they wouldn't have been redeemed if we'd stuck the, with them a bit longer? That's the first practical result. And the second theoretically important result is that it shows the dogs go where we point because we teach them to go where, where we point. Obviously, you don't say, I've got to, I, can't go, I'm out, I can't come out for dinner this evening. I've got to spend the evening training my dog to go where I point. That's not how it works. It doesn't need to work like that. You just need to have limbs that you can move and that occasionally have things in them that the dogs are interested in and that you let the dogs have. 
and the dogs will attend to the movement of your limbs through simple conditioning processes. So, shelter dogs do not lack the capacity to follow human points. They lack the experience to know what human gestures mean. And in fact, a normal healthy dog can learn that very quickly, as indeed a wolf can too. I said we did not train, this is what confuses people, because I say we did not train the wolves at Wolf Park to go where we point. But we believe, as a matter of theoretical principle, that the reason they went where we pointed is because they had become informally trained through their experience around people using their limbs to deliver things that the wolves were interested in. So that's uh, hopefully putting the record straight. All right. So now I'm going to talk quickly about a few other things. Nowadays, there seems to be something new in the press pretty much every week about some remarkable capacity of, uh, of dogs to understand people in different ways. Uh, this is a wonderful thing. I think it's great that we're rapidly building a new body of knowledge about what dogs can do. At the moment, I was tempted to try and structure this part of the talk around certain hypotheses as to what dogs might be able to do. But actually, I don't think the data fall very clearly one way or another. I find the pattern of results quite perplexing. And I just want to share that perplexity with you. So uh, here's a very simple experiment. Do dogs understand what a pipe does to an object? You show the dog this scenario. This was originally developed by Mark Hauser for use with monkeys. You drop a you show the animal that you've got a piece of desirable food in your hand, you then drop it in the top of this tube, and any idiot should be able to see that the food is going to end up here, right? Here's the tube, how could it be otherwise? But in fact, Brigitte Osthaus in Stephen Lee's lab now 10 years ago found that the dogs uniformly act on the assumption that gravity is the only force in play here. They uniformly seek the food in the opening right underneath where the food was put in. So dogs show no understanding of gravity and pipes in this kind of situation. Another interesting experiment, also by Osthaus and Lee, also modified from an experiment on monkeys. You have an enclosed box like this. It's transparent, though, so the animal can see through. You have a string with a treat on one end of it and a wooden block on the other end so as to make it easy for the animal to pull that string if it thinks that doing so would do it any good. Those of us that take our dogs for walks and they get stuck on the wrong side of the lamppost, you're on one side of the lamppost holding one end of the leash and the dog's on the other side of the lamppost on the other end of the leash and you're just standing there both pulling forwards and getting nowhere, you might not be surprised by the results of this experiment. Although, if it's simple enough, like I showed you in the picture, so here are the simple scenarios, just a single string, the dogs can do this. They will pull that one string if there is only one string. But when you start offering them some choices, so a pair of strings that are fairly close or far apart, then their performance starts to break down. If you make it even more interesting by having strings that run across diagonals, so that although this is clearly the end of the string with the food on, in fact, that end is closer to that food, uh, the same applies there, then they perform really pretty badly. And if you want them to be thoroughly confused, you cross the strings over, and they are useless at that. <laughs> so in terms of these understandings of the physicality of the world around them, they do not do very well at all. But here's what seems to me to be a much more complex environment where the dogs do seem to understand what's possible. So this is an experiment by Holly Miller in Tom Zentel's lab with uh, Rayburn and others, Patterson, Rayburn Reeves and others. What we're looking at here is a tray that's on a hinge, and behind it is one of those milk bone things that dogs love. Here's a sketch that shows us this. The dog sits in front, and what's going to happen is that the screen is going to be 
folded up. And it's going to be folded up in such a way that what happens is either perfectly plausible or is completely implausible. So here's an illustration using a teddy bear in place of the bone where the manipulation is perfectly plausible. The screen lifts up through 120 degrees so that it does not crush whatever's behind there. And so when the screen comes back down and the object is still there, that's perfectly plausible and reasonable. But they also did a condition where the screen goes all the way through 180 degrees, so it it's, should be impossible, right? The object that was there would now be completely squashed flat. The object should stop the screen from going all the way through 180 degrees. That should not be possible. And the question that the experimenters are asking is, do the dogs show any recognition that the 120 degree movement is perfectly plausible, whereas the 180 degree movement is impossible? Do they show any recognition of that? And the way that they measure the dog's confusedness about what it watches is that they have a camera on the dog's eyes and they're gonna look at how long the dog stares at what happens. So here's a video that shows it uh, now from the experimenter's perspective. So you can see there is the dog. We're not gonna see the screen move because of this black cloth that prevents us from seeing it. But, uh, well, let's let it run and you can see. Okay, the bone's being put in position. The screen is gonna be closed Travel for a moment. Now, the dog gets to see what's happening. That moves up. She's pulling away the bone from behind it. The dog can't see that happen. And now the dog is, you measure how long the dog stares at the situation that it's confronted with. Very convincing. Okay, so that's the end. And what they found was that indeed the dogs stared for almost twice as long at a screen that made an impossible movement as they did at a screen that made a perfectly plausible, reasonable movement, suggesting that they could discriminate the possible from the impossible in this situation. So uh, when it comes to pipes and gravity, dogs are clueless. When it comes to strings and how they connect parts of the world together, they're really not very good at that. But in this other situation, with perhaps a more subtle measurement of the animal's behavior, they show really quite a strong recognition of how the world should operate. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to what I find the most remarkable discovery in dog cognition of the last five or 10 years. It started in Germany where the research group that Brian Hare used to be associated with at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, Germany, was approached by an owner who said that their dog knew the names of hundreds of toys. And they tested this dog, Rico, who's now deceased, and it turned out to be really true that Rico knew the names of more than a couple of hundred objects. And there was a suggestion that Rico could learn the names of new objects by something called fast mapping, which is a sort of process of elimination. That if you gave the dog a new word and showed it a bunch of objects, some familiar but one new, then the dog would associate the new word with the new object, which is how it is known that small children are able to learn new vocabulary. So Rico was really intriguing. But Rico is also a little bit frustrating from a scientific point of view because the scientists who tested Rico were not the people who trained Rico. There's no record in the scientific literature as how it came to be that this dog had this remarkable vocabulary. Well, bring into the picture a retired psychology professor, John Pilly, at Wofford College in South Carolina, and his wife notices that he doesn't seem to have enough to do now that he's retired, and so she gets him a border collie. He hears about these experiments from this, this study from Germany, and he thinks, well, it would be interesting to try and teach my border collie the names of objects. And so John trains his dog chaser to the point that she ends up knowing the names of over 1,200 objects, 1,200 objects. So Monique and I were at a conference and met John Pilly, 
And I don't want to say I was skeptical, but I was a little skeptical. And um, fortunately, John was very welcoming, and he invited us to come up to South Carolina to meet Chaser for ourselves. And so here's this retired psychology professor, and on his back deck, he has a great pile of those big plastic boxes you can get at Walmart to keep things in that you might want to keep in. And each one of them is stuffed with hundreds of dog or child toys. And on every one of these toys, he's written in indelible ink in a marker pen, he's written a name for each object. And he doesn't remember the names of these. If you had, <laughs> if you had 1,200 toys, would you remember the names of every one? So he says to Monique and I, he says, well, go out on the back deck. I'll stay in the front of the house with the dog. You go to the back deck. Choose as many of these toys as you want. Here's a notepad. Write down the names of the toys uh, that you've selected on a notepad. Put 10 of them behind the sofa. And then Chaser and I will come back in. And I'll sit down on the sofa facing away, you know, so he doesn't see what we put there. Just hand me the list of 10 names of the 10 objects you've put behind the sofa, and, and I'll show you what Chaser can do. And so he sits down, he reads the first one. Chaser initially isn't exactly sure where we've put the toys, so we do gesture to her to make clear that the toys are behind the sofa, but I don't think that spoils it. She looks at them just like you or I, which is like, hmm, 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 and grabs one, brings it round to the front, John can't immediately praise her for getting it right because he can't remember what the names are. So he has to get her to give him the toy, look at the name that he's written, usually on the wash tag, and say, yeah, that's right. Well done, Chaser, that's right. And so she did this with a bunch of 10 objects, and then we got another 10 objects. She did it with another 10 objects, and we did it again, and we did it again. I don't know how many times we did it. The only time she appeared to make a mistake, it turned out that John couldn't read my handwriting and that he was asking for something that wasn't actually there. So she really can do this with 1,200 objects. Why 1,200? Why not 2,000? Because John had some students, he still lives close to the college where he used to work, and he had some students sort them all out. And when they were all sorted out, it turned out he had at least a dozen duplicates. He had not only forgotten what names he'd given them, he'd forgotten he'd ever had them before. And so he thought, well, it's really, you know, I've made my point. There's really nothing to be gained by taking this any further, and it wastes time if I'm coming up with duplicates. So uh, here's just a small selection from the many thousands. Um, how did he train her? He trained her by letting her play with the object. She's a very, very play-motivated dog, being a border collie, very work-driven. Um, he didn't, he said, he, and he didn't seem to really reward her much with, uh, with, with food, but uh, if she would, he would say, bring me the something, and if she could bring him the something, he would then throw it so she could chase it, or they would play tug of war with it, depending what kind of an object it was, or if it was an object that didn't really seem to be all that good for tug of war or for chasing, he would just get a rubber ball and let her chase that as the reward for finding something. And so he would do this 20 to 40 times with each new object, just the object on its own, until he felt that she was getting the name, and then he would start mixing the new object in with more familiar objects, until she could select it out of groups of up to 50 objects at the same time. Every month, he would do a complete test of everything she knew, and uh, she usually got, uh, well, when I say a complete test of everything she knew, it's not like he made a pile of 1,200 objects and went through every one of the 1,200 names. He would take them in groups of 20, all the objects that he believed she knew the names of, groups of 20, tell her to get this, tell her to get that, tell her to get the other thing, and go through them in 20s until she had gone through all the ones that she had. Her performance throughout was stunningly accurate. At one stage, he did a test, and the probability of her getting however many it was she got right correct was 0. 0.0000006. So whatever that is. So one six millionth or six billionth, or goodness knows what. This, so you've probably heard about this dog before, but I want to emphasize a few things that I have not seen other accounts emphasize. One is I want to show you this graph. This is Chaser's learning curve. What do you notice about it? It's not much of a curve, is it? It's straight. What does that mean? The number of words that Chaser learned went up perfectly steadily for the nearly three years. 
that John trained her on this task. I would have guessed that a dog's brain might begin to fill up that the dog, I mean, I put it in that silly sort of a way, but more technically, I would have guessed that the dog might begin to show interference in memory, just like I do. The more people I meet and the more names I try and remember, the more likely I am to muddle up people's names. You'd expect there to be a growth of interference. There is nothing to suggest that Chaser was showing any interference or any other kind of muddling as her vocabulary grew. Uh, when you look at that graph, it certainly looks like if John had been inclined to keep going for another three years, he could have had a dog with 2,400 words. If he'd gone for until she was nine years old, he might have had a dog with 3,600 words. It looks like if Chaser lived to be as old as I am now, her vocabulary might be just as good as mine is. I mean, it really it has nothing there to suggest that, there's a, that he's anywhere near the limit of that dog's vocabulary. The dog Rico was brought to the scientist by somebody in the, in the public, and they don't know what this family's habit was, whether they were perhaps circus performers who made it a regular thing to teach their dogs lots of words. Maybe they had a special strain of border collies who were exceptionally gifted in learning language. With John and Chaser, I asked John, we were on the back deck after we'd done this, and we were having some beers, and it was very pleasant. And we were looking at his backyard, and I said to him, John, is this backyard a Border Collie graveyard? Have you, how many Border Collies did you have to try in this and then quietly in the dead of night slaughter and bury so that you could move on to the next one before you found this dog with this astonishing ability? And he said to me, Clive, Chase is the only Border Collie I have ever tried this with. And that is a remarkable fact when you think about it. He got this, the only thing that's special about Chaser is that she's a border collie from a working line. She's not from a show line, she's from a working line. People still breed dogs to herd sheep even though there aren't any sheep to be herded. What it implies is that he could have done this with any other border collie. So it seems to be a power latent in at least that breed of dog. I cannot for the life of me believe that it's latent in many breeds of dog. And the fact that it's latent in this breed of dog is quite a deep mystery. I mean, border collies are remarkable, the way that shepherds can work with them to herd sheep, and the shepherds do use commands, either spoken, shouted, or whistled, to direct the dog what it should do. But there are nothing like 1,200 commands. I believe there are perhaps a dozen different commands that are used on border collies. Nobody has been selecting border collies over generations for larger and larger vocabularies. What was the other thought? Oh, the other thought was um, nobody asks a border collie to herd 1,200 sheep, nor do they expect the border collie to know the names of the sheep even if the sheep had names. I believe that shepherds working with dogs don't usually expect border collies to herd more than a couple of dozen sheep. They do have a belief that the dog has a sense whether it has all of the sheep or whether one's been left behind. But nobody ever says to the dog, oh, go and get, uh, you know, Flo the sheep or go and get Charlie the sheep. They don't do that. So it's really stunning that this dog has this apparent skill. And there's one more thing that I find really interesting about Chase's abilities, which I don't think has been enough emphasized. With Rico, Rico was only ever asked to go and get an object. And there were criticisms that it wasn't possible to say whether Rico really understood the object names as nouns or as implicit commands, a sort of a, to get the thing. Uh, it'll become clearer what I mean when I show you what John did. John trained three different verbs with chaser. And those verbs are take, which is the standard pick something up, paw, which means touch it with your paw, and nose, which means touch it with your nose. And he trained her to do this on just a few of the total objects that were in her vocabulary. Having trained her to do that with just a few of the objects that were in her vocabulary, he then tested her on three objects, lips, which is a sort of pink thing that looks a bit like some lips, ABC, which is a kid's cube with the letters of the alphabet on it, and lamb, which was a plush toy lamb. 
These three objects had never been used in the training of the three different verbs, take, pour, and nose. And yet he did a test where from behind a screen, he instructed Chaser to either take each object, pour each object, or nose each object. And after each trial, the objects are put back into position. Now John himself is behind this screen, so he cannot see what Chaser does. But another person sitting out of the camera shot here simply raises her arm when Chaser has made contact with one of the objects. That other person is giving John no feedback as to whether Chaser actually got it correct or not. Uh, but, Ch but John does know that Chaser has made contact so that he can call her back, praise her. He doesn't even know whether she got it right or not, but he praises her on every trial and then start the next trial. So I can show you, I cut just three trials out of a longer video. Chase. Take lamb. Take lamb. That would mean she's got to pick up the lamb and bring it back to him, or at least move it. To Papa. Okay. Good girl. Good girl. Papa. Papa. He calls Good himself girl. Papa when he's talking. Chase. Okay. Nose lips. Nose, Nose lips. lips. Nose lips. Good girl. Good girl. Good so he girl. cannot see that she's done it. He Good just girl. knows from the hand signal that she's done something. Good girl. Yeah. Good. 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 And he rewards her by throwing this ball that she likes to chase. Here. Here. Chase. Paul, ABC. Paul, ABC. Paul, ABC. Good girl, good girl. Go, go, go. So good I girl. just cut out, the video shows every possible combination of the three verbs with the three objects. I just cut out three example trials just to give you the flavor of it. And to emphasize, John cannot see through that screen. He doesn't know what she's actually done. He won't know how it all worked out until he analyzes the video at the end of the day. There's just somebody sitting off to the side to raise her hand so that he knows that she has made contact with the object and it's time to call her back and he rewards her whatever she did. So she was 100% correct in this test. She did not make a single mistake. So I find that one of the most remarkable aspects of the whole Chaser story. But it's not all of it. He also looked at her understanding of uh, categories. So given that if you accept that she understands nouns, what she understands are proper nouns, names of objects. But is it possible that she also understands common nouns, names of groups of objects? And so what we have here is a selection of the objects that she knows the names for, and half of the objects on here are balls, and the other half are not. And in this first video, he's going to ask her to collect Nine each circle. of the objects on that tray by its proper name. Yeah. Find circle, Chase. Yeah, put Chase circle in top. Uh, Chase, find weeding, find weeding, find weeding. Good girl, there's weeding, put weeding in top. Chase, find paws, find paws. There's paws, put paws in top. Watch paws. I selected only a few of the trials, and I see that I didn't select as smartly as I might have done, because I would have liked to have actually run through with you some of the trials where she's asked to collect one of the balls, because each of the balls has a unique proper name. And that's important. She was actually trained in total on 116 different balls. Each ball had a unique name. But then in this second trial, that's the same group of objects, but this time she's going to be asked to collect the balls simply by being asked to bring a ball. Find fuzzy, find fuzzy, get fuzzy. Yeah, there's fuzzy, put fuzzy in top. Chase, find a ball, find a ball. Find a ball, girl. Yeah, there's a ball, put that ball in the top. Find these balls and then we'll play chuck it. Get a ball, get a ball. Good girl, hurry. Yeah, there's a ball. Out, out. Go get another ball. Go get another ball. You're doing good, girl. You're doing good. Yeah, there's a ball. Put a ball in tub. Go get another ball. Good girl. Get another ball. Get a ball, Chase. Get a ball. Yeah, there's a ball. Put a ball in tub. Go get another ball. Put another ball. Get another ball. Yeah, there's a ball. Put a ball in tub. Okay. Just two more. Go get another ball, Chase. Get another ball. Put a ball in tub. Go get another ball. There's a ball. Put ball in top. Come here. You did 
did so good. You did so good. She laid down. Oh, is there another one there? Oh, uh, well, go get another ball, Chase. Get another ball. <laughs> yeah, get another ball. Yeah, there's that last ball. Put that ball in tough. Put that ball in tough right now. <laughs> So they did that with balls, and they could do that also with frisbees because she was taught the names of 26 different frisbees, so they were able to test her on frisbees. And the other thing they did was that they tried her on toys versus non-toys, although I find that a little bit less convincing because the non-toys were objects around the home that she was not allowed normally to touch. And so the fact that she might behave differently towards them, you could explain that in other ways. One more thing that I'll show you about Chaser is how she learned the names of a new object by exclusion. So here what you see is first she's going to collect a Chase. whole bunch of objects that she knows Pine the torches. names of. Pine torches. Pine torches. I'm going to show you two trials. Yeah, there's torches. The torches in tub. Out of Girl. the eight. Pine wow. And then this is the new name. Wow in tub. This is wow because wow's got two heads. Chase. Hang on. No, I'm sorry. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Airborne. Find airborne, Chase. Find airborne. Get airborne. Pop pop wants airborne. Get airborne, pop pop, Chaser. Find airborne. This is the Get new airborne. name. This Do is it, the girl. new Do name. It. Do it, girl. Do it. Do it, girl. Bring it to pop pop. Bring it to pop pop. Bring it to pop pop. Airborne. There's airborne. Good girl. Good girl. Pop, pop, what's airborne? No. Put, pop, put, pop, pop, you can tell. Fine, airborne. Fine, catch, airborne. Put in tough, put in tough. Chase, put in tough. Help, help. Good girl. You did good girl. So I misspoke. In the first part, I had cut out just two of the ten trials where she collects the objects that she already knew the names of. And then in the second part of the video, it's those same 10 objects, but now with an 11th object added that she has never seen before, and he uses a name she has never heard before, and we see that although she did look concerned, she got it exactly right, and she could learn the, uh, the, um, learn the new object name by pairing the new sound with the new object. So she's quite an amazing dog, quite an amazing dog, and I... I, I, I don't know what, it tell, what Chaser tells us about dogs. I, first of all, I, cannot, I don't have a hypothesis why that dog had so much what you could call surplus capacity, so much ability to understand what was required of her that seemed to go beyond what could ever have been asked of her ancestors at any point in the evolution of the dog, even a breed like a Border Collie, as I say. Nobody ever, there's nothing to suggest that any shepherd ever expected their Border Collie to understand so much. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that I find it hard to imagine that there would be many other breeds of dog where that kind of level of performance could be found. But I think, you know, um, Adam was talking earlier about, um, about um, what was his phrase? I noted it down because I thought it was very good. He, uh, trophy hunters versus killjoys. And I know that people predominantly think of me as a killjoy, but <laughs> I would be, I'm perfectly happy to also be a trophy hunter. I think we need both. We need to have our eyes open to the wonder of what dogs can do. And if that can be captured in ways that stand up to scientific rigor, then that's something we need to work on trying to explain. I think it's absolutely fascinating. OK. so. Uh, I've pretty much reached the end of what I wanted to say, but before I leave this stage, I want to say a tremendous vote of thanks to Prescott and to all of his team. I'm not, I, have, I know the names of some, but I know I don't know the names of all of the team. It's quite a substantial group of people that have made this possible, and I really hope that we will be able to keep this ball rolling because I think it has tremendous potential, not just for helping a more general public understand what scientists are doing with dogs, but I think bringing scientists of diverse views together and giving us a chance to beat each other up, I think that's actually tremendously constructive and will help us move the science forward. So thank you all very much.